Oh Allah, I kept this man from eating and drinking, this woman from eating and drinking and having intentions for their spouse all the daylight hours. And your Quran shall come and say, Ya Rabb, I kept him awake at night. Taraweeh, night time. In similar to the way the Prophet stood until the Sahaba, they would say, his feet would swell. They would say to him, Ya Rasulullah, has not Allah forgiven you? And the Prophet ﷺ says, should I not be a thankful servant? And I want you to really think about you know, the, the gravity and the magnitude of what happens in the month of Ramadan. 1,700 million people voluntarily refuse to drink or eat anything while the sun is up. Irrespective of race, nationality, language, climatic conditions, out of a desire for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in commemoration of the suffering and the endurance of those who are less fortunate than them. And in anticipation of receiving an elevated consciousness that helps them reflect more about their day-to-day -day life and the things that they are encountering as tests and trials. Fasting is for me alone. And I will give its reward fittingly. And when I say 1.7 billion, I actually mean most Muslims. What you find strange in the month of Ramadan is that people who don't pray, people who are busy with the dunya, busy with so many things, the month of Ramadan comes and within them, there is this drive to act as others act in the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You will even find people who are, you know, two packs of cigarettes a day, they'll put their cigarettes aside and count down the clock and the first thing they break their fast on is... They take a sip of water and they say, excuse me, brother, I'm just going to go outside. I, your garden is so beautiful, I just need to see it. Right? They restrain themselves. And this is a, pheno it's a phenomenon. It's a miraculous occurrence. It is a sign to humanity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love and influence for the ummah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But it's unification. And you find that those who will go thirsty in Mecca are those who will go thirsty in Kuala Lumpur and those who will go thirsty even above the Arctic Circle in Canada. So the month of Ramadan is a month of unity. And you feel this even within your own homes. All of a sudden, you're invited to someone's house and someone else has invited them and you haven't met this brother or this sister for years. And it could have been that there was a conflict that you had with them or something, and the month of Ramadan, the barakah of it, reunites you. So we want to look at the month of Ramadan from that perspective. My discussion with you today is the month of Ramadan, the month of family, the month of unity, and the month of patient perseverance in finding a way to change that which is within ourselves that we acknowledge is negligent. The first question I ask myself, Wallahi, you know, last Ramadan and this Ramadan, inshallah, are arriving. You know, there's some things that we needed to change. How do you think we've been doing? From what you recollect of last Ramadan, some of the challenges that you've had in your life, you've come a full year, 360 days almost now to the day, and the month of Ramadan is going to arrive. And you know yourself more than anyone else needs to know. You don't need to ask anyone about some of these things, right? You know about them. It could be disunity, you know, spousal problems. It could be children issues. It could be health. It could be material problems, work. 
you know, these challenges that we have, that we all have, that have lingered from one year to the next, sometimes from two years, three years to the next, what have we done with them? How has our life progressed from the Ramadan of past? Are we still in the same clothes, in the same habits, in the same attitude, in the same place, in the same home, doing the same thing, and have not improved in our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Are you still in the same argument with the same person? You sometimes find, oh my goodness, it's been a year and I haven't talked to her. I have totally boycotted him, and it's been a year. Ramadan to Ramadan. And you begin to reflect upon those who were with us last Ramadan. I don't want to cry. <laughs> you know, you remember those who you saw. And you remember those who are departed. And you think of those who are with you. And those who may depart from you. And you begin to think of those who matter. And those who you've given time to who really don't matter. See, it doesn't just work in those who you've cut out. But there's those who we've tried and pulled and pulled and pulled and they're not worth it. And there are those who are really worth it who we haven't acknowledged their worth and haven't spoken to them. And have acknowledged to them how much we care for them. And how much we accept responsibility and duty along with them. And how the days go, and how the years move, and how the experiences and the people who we love come and go, and how the consistency of our relationship with Allah, we pray, remains. And we begin with this hadith, which is really a hadith that is related to the month of Ramadan, where the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, would make dua. It's a dua for those who are around him to teach others that he would make it. And he would raise his hands up as Safiya, his wife, and Aisha, his wife, and Umm Salama, his wife. Three different wives of the Prophet report the same hadith from in his home. And he would say, Ya Muqallib al Qulub, O Allah, who turns the hearts, Thabbit Qalbi ala deenik. Keep my heart firm upon your way of life, upon this faith that you have destined for us to follow, this Islam. And this is where I want to begin my discussion with Ramadan. You will find that the aim of Ramadan, my dear brother and sister in Islam, is لَعَلَّكُمْ by chance, perhaps, if you have been granted fortune, if Allah chooses you, this is what the word لَعَلَّكُمْ, perhaps, if fortune was to be provided to you, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ It's a double ta, تَتَّقُونَ That you not just will have taqwa, but that you will aim to develop it. It's not لَعَلَّكُمْ You will, perhaps, have taqwa. تَتَّقُونَ The double ta implies that you will at least hopefully make an aim that in this month of Ramadan, through your fasting and devotion, you will develop within you the desire to increase your consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that only begins in the heart, my dear brother and sister in Islam. Everything that we do in life, the good and the bad and the ugly, starts in the heart. Your heart is the beginning of your deeds. And therefore you find some of the great Imams of Islam, they would say miraculous words really. Al Imam Al Hassan Al Basri, he would say, you know, Iman is not about hoping for things. It's not you say, oh man, I hope this Ramadan I'm going to pray every day Taraweeh. I hope. Inshallah. Inshallah. You know how we say Inshallah as if like you're saying, it's unlikely, but maybe. <laughs> You know, inshallah, it's unlikely. I hope uh, if Allah could, Allah could do anything. You hope? Where is the plan? Where is the action? Where is the ter determination? You know, the Prophet Sallallahu he censors us, he cautions us. He says, none of you, and as is the hadith in Sahih Muslim, is to make a dua and say, inshallah. 
You're not allowed to say, Oh Allah, bless my family, insha'Allah. Complete assurity and certainty that it will happen. It's not insha'Allah, it will happen. You have that desire in your heart, you have that commitment. Belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not whimsical. It's not just, I wish or I hope. The iman you have is that which is solid in your heart. And after it's taken root, it flourishes. It's like it's a plant that grows out of the heart and its fruits are shown in your deeds. The fruit of your heart is in your tongue, is in your sight, is in your hearing, is in your action, is in your movement. Perhaps in your heart you will have that desire to further your taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to develop that consciousness of Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. The heart also, my dear brothers and sisters, is the one where corruption, when it sets, it's difficult to remove it. It's as Allah says in the Quran, it's ran. Ran in Arabic means rust. Once rust sets in, it's very difficult to remove it. It takes a lot of polish, a lot of vigor, a lot of energy, a lot of effort. The spot of rust comes quickly. It tarnishes quickly. But to remove it takes years of effort. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, No, in fact, their heart has been enveloped with ran, rusting. Allah described some people about their hearts, some of the nations who came before us. They were hard-hearted. They were not merciful to one another and to others. The heart became so hard, it was like a stone. In fact, their heart became so bad, it was even greater in strength and rigidity and inflexibility and so unmanageable, it was worse than stone. And Allah even says, in fact, some stones you can find fissures of water will bore through it. You know, if you turn your tap and it's just a drop, 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 it'll put a hole through a stone. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, their hearts, nothing will penetrate it. Impermeable to the truth. Ashaddu qaswa. Ramadan comes to remove that rust. Let us look at how Ramadan affects the hearts. My dear brothers and sisters, nothing trains your heart better than deprivation. And it's tough to admit that sometimes. When you're full and when you're quenched, you'll drive by the hungry and not really feel what they feel. When you're in air conditioning, you don't feel how hot it is outside. And the heart doesn't recognize the needs that others deserve. The needs, not the wants, but the needs that are not met, except through deprivation themselves. And Allah has made it as a constant sunnah of spiritual development for our nation and the nations that came before us. Fasting and abstinence has been written upon you as it was written upon those before you with the aim of you developing consciousness. If you visit Rome, you'll find people still fasting. And I'm not just talking about food. You know, you come, you find a nun and you say to her, you know, which way to the Sistine's Chapel? And she just smile at you. And then she'll show you a card that says, I've taken a vow of silence, I can't speak. It's a form of fasting, abstinence. You find even in non-monotheistic faiths, gurus and you know, people in India, they don't eat certain types of food or certain types of drinks as a way of purging themselves of what they see as being an overindulgence in the worldly life. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to command his ummah to stop eating and drinking and cohabiting between the spouses as long as the sun is up. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Yuridu Allahu bikumul yusr. In the same verses, Allah says, He wants facility for you. He wants ease for you. This isn't to punish you. It's not to make you rebel. It's ease and comfort. And it's to help you recognize the needs of others. Seeks to illustrate, to make a movement in our heart, to feel what others feel. Hunger and thirst and need helps you feel what others feel. And it is an aim to cleanse your heart. For those who are ungiving, ungenerous, the Prophet ﷺ in the month of Ramadan, the Sahaba would say, he was like a tornado of generosity. Not once in the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ's whole life is it ever mentioned he had a meal alone. Ever. ﷺ. He would in fact overburden some of the wealthier Sahaba. You know, Abu Ayyub would come and say, Ya Rasulullah ﷺ, My wife's been saving dates and she's been saving flour. It's enough for us. Shh. Abu Huraira and these poor Sahaba, they're going to hear. Ya Rasulullah, come over to our house for dinner. And the Prophet said, Yeah, yeah, yeah Abu Huraira, come. Abu Huraira, call the people of Sufwa, bring them. And the, and the lady would look through the crack of the door. Yeah, what's happening? Why are all these people coming? Ya Abu Ayyub, I told you one, just the Muhammad Sallallahu And the barakah of the Prophet Sallallahu was in that. The barakah of the Prophet Sallallahu enters in our home through that generosity. Feel the anguish and the pain of others. I want you this Ramadan, I'm not saying suffer, but I'm saying monitor yourself. And sometimes we get so caught up in the spirit of Ramadan and the joy and the family and everything that we forget that outcome of feeling the pain of others. And the people that we invite to, to our home are the ones who are of similar status to us, similar friends to us, similar neighbors to us. But that's not how the Prophet ﷺ was. When you read his seerah, they would say, the person of poverty would hold the hand of the Prophet ﷺ and bring him down to his home to have a modest meal with him. You know, he would sit with the rich and the pauper, the poor and the kings, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's Ramadan, that's the spirit of Ramadan. The Prophet would link certain acts of worship along with fasting because they go hand in hand. They come together to make Ramadan better. And the first one is sadaqah, charity. The Prophet sallallahu says, Saum is a shield. It's obscurity, meaning that with your fasting, you hide your sins. Allahu Akbar. Look at the words the Prophet uses. It's a shield that a person protects himself from falling into hellfire with it. And then the next sentence, the Prophet ﷺ says, and giving charity secretly will extinguish Allah's wrath against you. Siyam and Sadaqah linked. Siyam and the Quran linked. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says in the hadith narrated by Imam Muslim, Siyam and Quran, they will make shafa'a for the servant who is practicing of them. Oh Allah, I kept this man from eating and drinking, this woman from eating and drinking and having intentions for their spouse all the daylight hours and your Quran shall come and say Ya Rabb I kept him awake at night meaning the intent of the Quran in Ramadan is when Taraweeh night time and I'm gonna tell you my dear brothers and sisters it's tough going to the Jama' and praying behind the Imam from when he starts to when he finishes Al Imam al Shafi'i Rahmatullahi alayhi. In the authentic narration, Rabia, his student, the people who lived with him, they say he would read the Quran outside his devotional prayers and taraweeh and tahajjud 60 times in the month of Ramadan. That's twice a day other than in prayers. 
Allahu Akbar. Al Imam al Zuhari, one of the main links in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ from the Tabi'een, he would close the books of hadith and tie them up with the leather, meaning they're not going to be open for the 30 days of Ramadan and sit in front of his Mus'haf in reading. The Quran was intended, Shahr Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al Quran. Turn your devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through seeking the Quran in this month. Eloquence in the recitation of the Quran can be achieved in the month of Ramadan. The love of the Quran, the dedication you put in it, the time you give in it, it returns to you. And the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, says, nothing will leave your hands and your grasp and your memory quicker than your Quran. How many of us have known a surah our whole life and we come and then we, ah, oh, I can't remember, you know, you stumble in it. Why? And it's a way of Allah telling you, come back to the Quran, read me, study me. Another link that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes for us in the month of Ramadan, amazing intentional ibadah, is to stand in the prayer. You know, we talked about the Quran and hearing it and reading it. But the act of standing, the qiyam, the standing of Allah, and feeling, you know, your back hurt a little bit. Qiyam, and finding comfort in standing, in similar to the way the Prophet stood until the Sahaba, they would say, his feet would swell. They would say to him, Ya Rasulullah, has not Allah forgiven you what has happened and what would happen if it would happen? And the Prophet ﷺ says, should I not be a thankful servant? Allah says to the Prophet ﷺ, be active in your night prayers except few hours. Nisfahu. Allah begins by saying half of the night. Alhamdulillah, we're not Muhammad ﷺ. Half of the night? In Ramadan, you begin and it's hard and it's tough. And the first day and second day, you have energy. And you will notice the masjid, the first three nights of Ramadan are jam-packed. As soon as the imam gets to Surah Al-Ma'idah, it's like, what's wrong with Surah Al-Ma'idah? I look around, there's no one behind me. Surah Al-Ma'idah is a tough surah. No one wants to hear about Surah Al-Ma'idah. You get to Nisa, Ma'idah, Al-An'am, Al-A'raf, you lose them. Khalas. You see him again? Ah, 15th, 20th, the masajid begin to, ah, khalas, the last 10 days. The Prophet ﷺ, he says, the one who stands up with an imam until he is silent, the imam is quiet from the reading, to him is the reward and the reading of the one who led the prayer, Allahu Akbar, because of the qiyam in the month of Ramadan. I want to inspire myself. You know, we've talked about what we should do. Focus on sadaqah, focus on Quran, and focus on the taraweeh. Kick people out of your house. The Prophet says, Shahru Ramadan, the month of Ramadan, Shahrun Mubarak. The entirety of it is full of barakah. The gates of the heavens are opened and the gates of hellfire are closed shut, and the evil intentions of the shayateen against us are held at bay, in accordance to our sincerity of Allah. You know, we hear this hadith, the shaytan is chained. It doesn't simply mean your shaytan, my shaytan. No, some of us, a chain can have a length. He's still following you, but his influence is diminished. What is the measure of that it's your sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala barakah seek the barakah in the month of Ramadan second to uplift us the Prophet ﷺ says there's a gate in Jannah none shall enter from it except those who have fasted consistently Babu Rayyan none shall enter it except you and I bi idnillah ta'ala fast with sincerity to Allah Finally, the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, the one who fasts Ramadan, and in another generation, the one who stands in prayer in Ramadan, 
And the third narration, the one who stands in prayer in Laylatul Qadr. So the one who fasts Ramadan. And the one who stands every night in Ramadan. And the one who stands in particular in Laylatul Qadr. For that person, if they have Iman in Allah and hoping for reward, their sins are forgiven. The Prophet says, As Salawatul Khams, the five daily prayers. And one Jumu'ah till the next Jumu'ah. You pray Jumu'ah and the next Jumu'ah. And Ramadan to Ramadan, they expunge the errors that you have made as long as you leave off the major sins. You become clean in the month of Ramadan. Finally, my favorite hadith that is with regards to the month of Ramadan, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah says, and the Prophet narrates, fasting is for me alone. And I will fit, and I will give its reward fittingly. Meaning, you sitting in front of another brother or sister today, you will fast and they will fast. Same hours, same abstinence from water, food and drink. But your consciousness and your devotion to the fast and its effect on your heart and how you interact with others is uplifted in comparison to the person sitting next to you who's fasting and hungry and thirsty and grumpy as well. And you will be rewarded more than him or her. And it works the other way. Because it is only Allah who measures it. Only Allah who measures the fasting of your eyes, the fasting of your ears, the fasting of your tongue, the fasting of your heart, your abstinence, your restriction, your holding back for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Finally, I wish to say my dear brothers and sisters that the month of Ramadan is a month that comes and goes and it's an opportunity. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses whom he wills with it. And Jibreel who made a dua and the Prophet said ameen to it. As the Prophet climbed his steps of his pulpit, Jibreel made a dua by saying, the one who lives to see one or both of his parents in old age, and they are not granted forgiveness because they have not shown their parents love and respect. Allah, may Allah cut them, meaning not show them mercy. And the Prophet said, Ameen. And then the Prophet وسلم, climbed up the second step and Jibreel made a second dua and said, the one who greets and lives through the month of Ramadan and does not earn Allah's forgiveness by working hard in that month of Ramadan, may Allah distance him and cut him off from his mercy. And the Prophet said, Ameen. And then the third step, and the one who hears your name mentioned, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and does not send the salah and the salam upon you, may Allah cut them off. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, Allahumma Ameen. If you come at the end of Ramadan and you don't feel cleaner, better, more attached to Allah, with a cleaner heart, with better friends, with a greater attitude, with more stamina and strength and ability to stand in prayer at night, that your Quran reading is more fluent, that your love for hearing the Quran is greater, you find comfort in it. Allah bi dhikrillahi tatma'innul qulub. If you don't come to that end of the month of Ramadan and find that comfort and mercy from Allah, be weary.